Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your day to make a point of not only discerning what the needs of the community are, uh, but also getting into the heart of like, hey, if we're going to address these things across the city, across the region, we're going to have to do this together. We're going to have to try to do the types of bottom up sort of actions that not only make our places more safe, but also make them more livable and inviting. Um, and so in a moment here, once the slides are up, we'll, we'll get started with the activities, or I mean the, the responsibilities that we have to address the challenge of escaping out of a housing trap. And I'll explain what I mean uh, that uh, the way that we talk about it at Strong Towns as a trap that we have all unwittingly found ourselves in. Uh, the things that were intended as a means of building prosperity have instead turned against us and created the conditions that we're uh, struggling with. In this talk, um, my background is as a pastor, so I am prone to being long-winded. So I've already got my eye on the clock, and I know that we kind of need to clear out of the room by 7.45, which does give me a full hour. This is amazing. No. Uh, we'll make sure that there's time for a Q&A afterwards. And uh, just ever so briefly to sort of uh, anchor a few things for you, um, for some that are working in the industry or working uh, as planners or in other uh, professions, uh, this may seem uh, somewhat repetitive of things that you've heard elsewhere. But the goal here tonight, and then for others, is going to be like, all right, I'm just dipping my toe into this. And I want to try to meet our whole group where we're at, uh, be able to give you something that you can latch on to and really understand as like, here is the challenge, the, the difficulty, the, the intensity of the, of the need that faces us uh, within our communities. And the challenge that we have right now is that as I experience, um, my, my lease is up at the end of September. And for four years, I've been working in, uh, or well, three years officially running a local conversation group in Delta, but before that, a couple of years prior, also working at it. I've been at this for like five years trying to bring down the damn rent, and it's still not any lower. The amount of housing supply has only shrink, or shrunk in our, in our area, and the trouble that my wife and I and our nine-year-old face when we try to find yet another place to live is that we're good, we have so few options and so little to choose from. And this is a consequence of so many of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. So on the one hand, I want to avoid pre presenting sort of the, the grand unifying theory, but I do want to give an account of how we ended up here that maybe is different than a simplistic version that says, well, it's because of bad landlords, or it's simply because of government corruption, or it's a consequence of us living uh, bounded by mountains and the border and ALR land. That is not the reason we have a housing shortage at all, although it's a convenient one when people look around and they say, well, Maybe we've just run out of room. No, we've run out of the will to actually make good use of the room that we have. And so we are trying to change that. Um, we're a small, scrappy nonprofit. Uh, 15 years, uh, that, about 15 years that um, Towns has existed, uh, trying to reach into new audiences with a message of a very different approach to building uh, capacity in our communities. And so the challenge tonight is what can be done to provide housing to people in places where that housing has become scarce and expensive and sadly, even as we see the, the tectonic plates beginning to shift at the provincial level, uh, we're going to see a provincial housing campaign uh, that is going to be marked by very different sides, a very clear contest or contrast uh, between opposing uh, priorities and opposing constituencies. Some that have every reason to leave things as they are. Others that are saying we have every reason uh, to bring about change in terms of housing availability, housing options, housing types and choices. So vote. I'm not telling you who to vote for, uh, but do make sure that you're part of the process. Two resources I want to briefly introduce you to. The first is uh, written by my uh, colleague and friend, Chuck Marone, uh, with my uh, former colleague, Daniel Harrigus. Uh, it's a great book. It outlines a lot more in detail of what I'm going to share with you tonight. But a local resource that is also excellent on this question is Nathaniel Louster's The Death and Life of the Single Family House. From him, I will use the phrase, the grand bargain. And the grand bargain in Vancouver's development history was the assurance that those that had means and often came from privileged backgrounds could essentially say to the commissioners and the planning departments in the city of Vancouver, we will allow the downtown, what is now the downtown, the Portlands, we will allow that to be rough and tumble. We will allow that to be where development occurs. We will allow that to be where Chinese laundries, for example, to, we were very rigorously restricted so they could only appear in those places, along with many other things that were deemed to be undesirable. That's where all that can go. And the rest of the area will be reserved for single-family homes. 
large, significant property sizes, the capacity to preserve the na uh, neighborhoods like Shaughnessy and others uh, that would continue to, in a sense, keep away the riffraff, a story that we know is tragically is rooted in so many different impulses that are, are racially and class-based uh, oriented. And out of that, as Nathaniel uh, Louster says, there was the grand bargain. You could do what you need to in the port areas, and then we're gonna do what we need to to preserve our access, to preserve our way of life in these suburban style neighborhoods. And the consequence of this is devastating when all of a sudden the port lands come under increased viability. The likelihood of someone saying, oh, I can see myself living there, began to emerge, especially after Expo 86. And we get into the cycle where all of a sudden there was great opportunity to actually make use of undervalued properties in the core of Vancouver while simultaneously being hemmed in, being hedged in by this band of single family uh, only neighborhoods. With the consequence being that displacement was inevitable. There was no nearby neighborhood that someone priced out in the core could move out to. And yet, as we'll touch on, this was actually central to the traditional development pattern that when you have a properly functioning city, not one that has been twisted and, and distorted through subsidies uh, and regulations, one of the things that happens is you always radiate out and the places of greater opportunity are just a little bit further. You, you go until you have the capacity to cover your basic needs and afford the housing that is there. The struggle that we have is that we've put that milestone in mission in hope, so far beyond where our present day people are able on a regular income to be able to live. And so this is a consequence of the housing trap that we're in. This is a consequence, and I'll explain what the trap element of this is in a moment, but here at Strong Towns we, we say that the next increment of development should be allowed by right in every neighborhood in America. And on the one hand, say in the province, here in the province, with the uh, regulations that allow up to four units per lot, you could say, oh, this has now been satisfied. But in actuality, it only punts down through uh, maybe a couple of decades before we're going to be up against it. Four units is not sufficient to meet local demand. And yet those regulations, the, the arbitrary selection of what point of stasis a neighborhood should reach, what point of development should basically be the cap is going to be where the contest is continuing to happen. Uh, if you care about housing policy, you'll know what I mean by an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit. Here in Vancouver, we call them laneway suites or cottage, uh, cottage uh, courts or things like this. Well, one of the things that's so striking is a lot of places have realized, oh, we can make that palatable. That type of housing, we'll, we'll allow that. Now, nobody notices it. I always say it's like stealth density. The kind of density that you wake up one morning, you're like, oh, I didn't realize there was somebody living in my backyard and they're paying me rent. That's the kind of development uh, that was commonplace throughout history and should be commonplace in our cities. And yet one of the challenges that we have is that our city leaders belatedly say, we will accept that. But the question is, what happens as intensity increases, as pressures continue to mount? Is there a way a strong a, a way that makes your place stronger that actually responds immediately or, or presently to felt need rather than allowing the pressure to build and build and build. And so this is where it is still considered radical and contrary to sort of the planner's mindset uh, to allow the next increment of development. That is, if it's a duplex, that it becomes a triplex or a fourplex. If it's a two-story walk-up, uh, older rental building, that it can become a four-story. By right, in that neighborhood, every life cycle that the building goes through. We say at Strong Towns that a person with a ninth grade education and a hammer should be able to walk into City Hall at nine in the morning and leave by noon with permission to build at the next increment of development. If they have a single family home, it should be simply a matter of course that of course you can build that duplex uh, as you adapt your living spaces, as you adapt to the needs of the people that are around you, but also that the property owners who own the, the run-down three-story rental apartment should have the ability to, of course, come in and establish, if they wish, the next increment of development, the next level of intensity. And we always say, because of our present-day circumstances, we do have to carve out the fact you can always go through the slow lane, which is our current zoning regulations, all of the systems that we have in place. If you want to make a sudden leap, the Vancouver style, which is we've got a single family home, we knock it down, and suddenly we stick up eight stories. If you want to do that, in a sense, we're saying 
we'll accept that that's going to happen. The big developers are gonna go through that process. People that are very skilled in this practice of, of large, sudden leap development are going to be doing that. But one of the things that we stress as one of the ways that we escape the housing predicament that we're in is to allow many more people access, many more people the ability to be participants in actually building new housing types, new housing units. And this is where it's critical to allow the next increment of development of in, by, in, by right in every neighborhood in America. If you haven't come across this concept, definitely encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's really critical. Because the challenge that uh, we'll go a little bit more into the, not the theory, but the story, the narrative of what our path has been like, is that this path that we're on, meant as a means of securing prosperity for all, when you judge people's motives in the most generous way. There was a conviction, we can build lasting prosperity. But the trouble is, is it has unwittingly trapped us in a system that is incapable of building lasting prosperity. And so our core conviction at Strong Towns is that local and iterative actions, even things like simply sticking stickers on the driveway uh, to make people think a second way, uh, causing people to look around and say, oh, this is somebody that loves this place, this is somebody that cares about this place. People taking ownership of public spaces as well as encouraging investment in private spaces is all critical to this path. It's never gonna be one grand huge leap centrally planned and, and meted out to all the masses. Instead, it's gonna be about local and iterative actions to create and then sustain local prosperity. I wanna introduce you to the concept that no neighborhood should be subject to radical change and no neighborhood should be exempt from change. And again, this is something that we see as a direct contrast with so much of the patterns of development that are underway. Uh, if you fly into Toronto, for example, you'll see the tall and sprawl development pattern. And really, if you fly into Vancouver, you see virtually the same thing as well. You see sudden changes, radical changes, as well as so many other neighborhoods that are virtually or almost entirely exempt from change. And so crucially, our provincial government has said, hey, we're gonna take action on this. And they're not alone, New Zealand has done this, uh, Washington State, California, uh, Montana. Montana actually passed their legislation saying we're gonna avoid being like California and we're gonna do it our way and yet the outcomes are virtually the same because the recognition was we have done so many things to suppress the natural emergent change needed in our places, the things that actually result in significant numbers of new housing units being available at prices that people can manage on their local incomes. These are the types of things that we've made so difficult. And so here's the predicament. It's like, does it get any easier quickly? Um, while we are mobilizing on these issues, you're gonna face the scoffs or the, the, the scoffers that say like, look, you know, Norm, you've been working at this for four years. You started a group for better land use and more housing in Delta. You're three years in. What are you talking about? That, that, it's only gotten worse in by your own account. Well, the challenge is that we are still seemingly part of a worsening problem and the housing relief won't immediately materialize. But this is where we believe that if we can anchor our approach into really well-grounded principles of how did traditional neighborhoods, how did cities sustain themselves, how did they meet the needs of local residents, how did they provide additional opportunities for people to get ahead, in that context, we can then begin to take action here. And if we do so, we can commit ourselves to a path of action uh, that's, that's not as susceptible sort of the, the whims and the wills of, of the three-year or four-year election cycles. And so this is our, our North Star. Um, it's not sentimentalism. This is grounded in observation that the traditional pattern of development offers a reliable path to freedom from the housing trap. And we'll, we'll circle back to outlining that traditional development a little bit more in a moment. But this language of a trap is something that uh, Chuck Marone uh, outlined for, for me and then for other audiences as well. And it's, it's based on the idea that you see something similar with the agriculture trap. Our ancestors as practicers or practitioners of hunting and gathering had the capacity to sustain human population in various regions, uh, chiefly through somewhat nomadic exercises or situating themselves in really uh, fertility rich areas. So if you were on the coast, you had reliable, dependable sources of salmon. But if you're on the prairies, you're moving with the bison, you're taking other steps uh, in the North American context. And we see this all over. And the reality is that on the basics of, of what you had available to you, you could sustain a certain amount of population. But then, bright people said, 
What if we started farming? What if we began to cultivate just a little bit of the soil? If it's good for the bison, maybe we can make something out of it that's good for us. And so as a result, you see a population that then becomes open to the idea of no longer traveling with food, but instead bringing food into places where they could manage it, cultivate it, and improve upon it. And, and this was the agricultural revolution. Out of this, one of the great benefits of an agricultural revolution, this one in particular, was the capacity to generate significantly larger amounts of food. And so the conviction was, why did we ever chase buffalo? What were we thinking? This is so much better. And the result of this is that they were then able to, and obliged to, as their population grew, create more and more cultivation of plants. And, and as a result, actually began to lose track of what it took in order to be hunter-gatherers because they had to commit more and more resources to being in place, cultivating those resources. And if drought came, or if, if some uh, famine came along, uh, if there was a, a plague, uh, some sort of locust, or whatever it was, you basically had to hunker down and, and, and try to survive because in a hunter-gatherer society, you would move where the food was. But remember, in the agricultural revolution, it was you bring the food and now you have it available to you. But that came at a significant cost, that you could go for a year with very little, which the result would be, in a large and growing population, the only thing that you could do then was double down, double down. You could not go back to the amount of population that was sustained at the, at the time when you were in the hunter-gatherer stage, because in that time, you had a much smaller population that could suitably live off of the available produce, the resources that were available. And so the only way to go back when you're in the agriculture trap is to have widespread diet, to significantly drop your level of population in order to then be able to return to a pattern of living in the way that used to occupy us. And something very similar has happened with housing. Something very similar has happened with housing, and, and it's sort of like a ratchet strap. Once you've once you've ratcheted up the pressure, uh, I mean, there's a release on a ratchet strap for a reason to make it useful, but in this context, I want to think about that idea that the pressure has built and created the conditions that it is now so difficult for us to go back to the pattern of traditional neighborhood development, allowing the neighborhoods to thicken up, to emerge, uh, to have local investment rather than simply expanding horizontally, continuing to sprawl outwards at significant pace. And, and we'll touch on the way in which this sprawl, this, this horizontal expansion, was kicked into overgear, or, or over, overdrive, I should say, but, but it's a consequence of trading complexity and adaptability for growth and predictability. These are the hallmarks of a modern system, that it's capable of growth, persistent growth, as if we've never learned that there's no such thing as perpetual motion, as persistent growth, and predictability, that we can simply replicate carbon copies of so many of these core features. We can take a zoning bylaw from Euclid in New York and, and export it everywhere and it will meet uh, conditions. We've, I was chatting with an administrator in Green River, Arizona. Has anyone heard of Green River? No, there's a reason, because like nobody lives there. But they have parking regulations for six story and above towers. Why? Because they've gone and done the very thing that is so predicated on expectations of growth and a predictable pattern by simply importing what suits other places and using it and, and not even adapting it, just like copying it wholesale to their place. And so this is a consequence that we see that there was policy, think parking requirements, uh, think lot setbacks, think zoning in very prescribed ways, think the separation of uses in order to be able to keep dirty things on one side, I always say, if it's not a slaughterhouse, like somebody should be allowed to build it next to you. Like, I, I understand we don't want noxious uses, but zoning regulations have become so pervasive with the effort to try to regulate every different type of use and find it each in its particular place st in a static way, frozen in time. And the result of this, along with so many subsidies that enable this in a flurry of construction, resulted in a dramatically simplified method of building out cities. And that's what we talk about as the suburban experiment. And the housing trap became firm. We became entrapped in this when we said, as a nation, as, as across North America in particular, we will commit to the suburban experiment. This open air, continent wide experiment in building out communities in a way that's very different from the way of our ancestors. Uh, this consequence is that we have lost sight of what it takes to build places that are complex, 
emergent. One of the things we say is a good city planner, a good city leader is much like a conservation biologist. Not a watchmaker, not a tinkerer, but somebody that is able to actually just observe the ecosystem. Observe those, the small inputs. Observe, hey, why do we have more children playing in this area? And how do we begin to cultivate the conditions that are good here and export them? Share that wisdom, share that insight, and, and adapt it at the local level. Uh, this is the difference between cities that are complex versus ones that are simply complicated. Uh, this is part of the Strong Counts canon, that we need to get back to, to understanding that our cities are, are complex. Uh, Jane Jacobs has a great question where she says, what is the problem of a city? And she said, the problem of a city is not that it's a machine that simply has broken down. It's that it's an organism, a, a, an emergent sort of life force that needs to be carefully cultivated, but often done so almost with a sense of wonder that some sort of alchemy is happening. And again, that sounds like voodoo, but it's, it's true. We need to actually look at so many different places and, and see what's going on uh, when we try to overmanage, overprescribe, and overregulate so many of the things that are happening. I visited a place, Port Arthur, Texas. They brought me in to do a speech uh, for them for their uh, symposium of small businesses. I learned the year prior they had somebody come in who was telling them how to franchise ready their city by preparing all of their perimeter roads along the highway uh, for franchises. to basically put in all the inputs and then they could sit back and watch the prosperity come in. I took a dim view. Um, I don't think I lost my invite to come back, but you know, it was a little touch and go for a moment. Because I was explaining to them, I said, look, you've got a downtown plan that lays out in minute detail where you expect little shops to be, where you think ice cream can be sold, and where you think lollipops can be sold. I almost am exaggerating, but not quite. And in that context, I said, look at your city right now. It looked like a bomb had gone off in Port Arthur. There's so little investment that has happened, and the very little in places where investment still is present are places that are then hemmed in and restricted by parking requirements and so many other things. I said, you need to allow that to, to flourish, to foster life there, not try to continue to deaden it. Um, they said, well, we might have a parking problem in 70 years if we don't have parking for each of the new projects that we approve. I said, that would be the least of your problems in 70 years. Prove us wrong. And so in this context, this is again the contrast between places where we say, our communities are complex. Uh, the gas town experiment, be like, let's see what works, let's tweak it, let's refine it, rather than saying, up front, we know that this will happen. That could not be known, our places are complex, it depends on how many cruise ships come in and how people use the space, and whether or not the local businesses open their doors to embrace a new pedestrian air, pedestrianized area, so many different things like this. And so in this context, I, I'm trying to do a minute per slide, and that was far from a minute per slide. Um, but we need to really embrace and, I, and understand that our cities are complex and not complicated. Uh, this is an example. If it didn't show you the image, uh, it could be Vancouver, it could be uh, Port, uh, Prince Rupert or Prince George or any number of other places across BC. Uh, but this is my community in Ladner. And here you can see so many of the key features of the traditional development pattern uh, that really, as, uh, again, I appealed to Nathaniel Lasser. He said, what happened was there was a grand bargain to say, we want less of that, and we basically are going to switch gears. We're going to change into a suburban pattern of development. And one of the things, again, to highlight in the traditional development pattern is the, the, mix, of size, uh, the, the, the mix of sizes and uses within a space. Uh, this happens to be in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but again, it could look like so many of our emerging cities as they developed around the turn of the, cent of the prior century. And, and in these places, you see the complexity. You see that many of the places began with small, modest structures, but very rapidly, as opportunity emerged, people would cover their lot. They would use all of the productive land that was available to them, rather than being arbitrarily re restricted from doing so in the way that we see currently. Uh, I was just down in Seattle and they were talking about somebody who had converted a front facing garage into a cidery or a cidery or no, a meadery or a cidery or a beer, wherever, some place for people to get boozed. And as a result, uh, the city had come in and they, they said, oh, we could barely tolerate this. And yet our ancestors would say, no, this is what it takes uh, to allow a thriving place. This is when you go into various communities in Mexico or you go into various communities. I was just on the phone uh, with a young woman from India and she said, like, when I hear what you're describing, it just blows my mind because our places allow this flourishing, this complexity, uh, this lot coverage, the allowance for incremental growth and adaptation. And so 
uh, looking again at, at Grand Rapids, we saw this, this shift in the development pattern without the corresponding increase in capacity that this would create for communities. Um, if you are familiar in a little bit with Strong Town's language, you'll understand the idea of a value per acre analysis. And one of the things that we would do, and we do this all the time, and I ran out of time to do it for you tonight for Vancouver's purposes, is to compare the value that was being produced on a per acre basis for any of these sites and compare it to what has replaced it or to the versions that we make available uh, to uh, our communities uh, at present. Uh, in Delta, for example, we have a McDonald's that's right in prime position, right by the transit exchange and the hospital, and there's a police and a fire department right there, as if they need that or, at, right at hand, and, and it's in a prime position, and they pay one-seventh the amount of property tax that the local coffee shop right in Ladder Village does. And I would say, you know, how much do we delight in the culinary, like, wonder of the McGriddle that we're willing to subsidize it to such an extent? It is at a way a weak economic performance of these places and here in Grand Rapids uh, by stripping away so much of the complexity this is the exact same street by stripping away the capacity in this place to build wealth they've res they've impoverished their community they've made it more difficult and I would even say it looks less interesting it looks less interesting and critically it also has far fewer owners far fewer participants, far fewer uh, dynamic uses, uh, you have far less flexibility. Uh, Vancouver has in some ways dodged this bullet, uh, partly because of transportation policies that have allowed uh, for, or basically restricted, uh, despite many in the city's best desires to run freeways through, to basically urbanize by means of this American pattern what downtown would have otherwise been like. Been like. But, but what I find interesting is that there was someone on Pinterest, they were comparing, you know, this this street and, and what it is now. He said, oh, maybe I just prefer old-timey stuff. And, and this is where at Strong Towns we're like, no, it's not old-timey, it's actually like better. It financially outperforms, it allows way more people to participate in the local market, it actually is, is a more dynamic streetscape, it's a place that provides far greater opportunity, even the amount of housing on that street compared to what it became. So many different factors, and this is because of a con uh, this is a consequence of the lack of incremental growth, the absence of complexity, and the desire to have suburban style standards smuggled into city cores. Oh, my meeting is over in ten minutes. That's a tip. Yeah, sorry, that's a forty minute. Thing. Okay, that's that's fine. They'll, they'll still go right. oh, after. Sounds good. <laughs> hey, if you're on Zoom, uh, you'll get the recording after. Um, and so, what does this mean? One of the challenges that we had is as a consequence of the massive amount of subsidy that flowed out to the suburban style development, it resulted in many of these places struggling to perform because the natural evolution of the neighborhood was restricted by the outflow of capital. And that was by design, that was deliberate, uh, that was often done with a version, with an idea that if we can remove the capital, if we can let landlords simply allow arson to take care of old buildings, we will basically get a new, clean, fresh, modern city. We will have a no longer complex ecosystem, we'll simply have a complicated machine where we know where everything belongs. Out of this, because of the smuggling in of suburban style zoning requirements, because of the smuggling in of various transportation standards, you began to see segregated uses so that there was no way to have a rooming house next to a pub, next to a hostel, next to a medical clinic. You also began to see a withdrawal of any meaningful investment in the streetscape so that sidewalks became degraded, so that, I mean, one of the things that blows my mind is that in Ladner, we had like massive, probably from here to here, boardwalks in Ladner Village. And now, except for the areas that they've reconstructed, it was all downsized to so almost like postage stamp things where you have to jostle with everybody before you can make passageway with them. And how did we decide? that that was an upgrade? How did we decide uh, that we would do better with this? Uh, one of my favorite, um, it's not Stuart Downey, is it Stuart Downey, the YouTuber, uh, Downey Live, he does a thing at the Vancouver Transit Museum where he goes and looks at the, what the streetcars were and then that which replaced them, which is the suburban bus, suburban style bus. And, and he asked at one point, like, how did we decide that this was better? And so it isn't just nostalgia, it's actually evidence-based examples of, of the ways in which we have seen uh, the degrading of our streets uh, as well as the dispersal of resources rather than the concentration of capital as well as the limited opportunity to adapt 
How many of these places, if you went back to Grand Rapids where I got these pictures from, are grandfathered? That is, they are allowed to exist in their present state if they haven't been knocked down. But heaven forbid that you actually invest in it because then you basically open up a Pandora's box. You open up a can of worms and nobody in their right mind wants the amount of mental energy and brain damage that comes from having to go through this process of just adapting these buildings, using them to a fuller function, which is, again, something that if we travel overseas, if we travel into other communities, we see happening all the time. Again, I don't want to romanticize other places as they've got it all figured out, but you go in to Japan and various streets uh, in, in Tokyo and you ask, how is it that there are so many like awesome, cool little shops? How is it that there's so much vibrant, hustling sort of activity in these places? And it's a consequence of actually allowing this adaptation to occur over life cycles of a building, allowing it to take place within the community. And so what has this done uh, to our communities? Again, notice complexity and its absence. The lot coverage, really allowing those types of things rather than resisting it or saying, oh, if you want to build uh, to the full extent of your lot, uh, you're going to be uh, in violation of our parking requirements. You're, you're going to basically ask for all sorts of trouble. Uh, incremental growth and adaptation uh, being critical to this. Uh, this is Delta's uh, land use map. It's interesting if you come to Ladner uh, and you visit, it's really hard to see there, but it's sort of laid out in a very fine grid. And one of the, the great things about Ladner Village is that it, it, the areas that they did not tear down as urban blight in the 1960s, the vast majority of the areas that are marked on maps that the city had produced for them that were all designated as urban blight, it's because we lack the money that we didn't knock them down, and now they're the reasons that people actually want to be in Ladner Village. And all the stuff that came into its place in the 1960s is the stuff that is primed for redevelopment, and yet because of its scale, it makes it too difficult to redevelop it, redevelop it all at once. And so we've lost sight of what it takes to have the types of building patterns that actually generate lasting wealth and opportunity and adaptation. So what changed? Well, as the Great Depression occurred, I want to touch on a little bit of the financial story because this is an, a key aspect of the uh, problem that we face. This is a key part of the trap and the way in which that trap was set. Remember, hunter-gatherers had a limited capacity, but they could manage. Then they discovered agriculture, and they said, oh, it's completely expanded our capacity. But the result of this was that now they could not go back. This was a consequence of, in the 1930s, in the, 19, uh, in the 20s and 30s, uh, the consequence of the Great Depression was the realization we need to be able to keep people on their properties. We need to be able to backstop their ability to stay in a place rather than being kicked to the curb by landlords or by banks that were just trying to scrap, um, pardon me, scrape back just a little bit of the investment that they had made. And so one of the things that they did is they said, we will secure mortgages and we will allow homeowners uh, to, who normally would be on very limited means, we will allow them to basically borrow over longer in order to be secured in their place. The benefit of this is that there were fewer people that were kicked to the curb. That still happened, and the consequences of that were significant. But there were fewer of them. It was one of the ways of coping with the Great Depression, an unforeseen worldwide cataclysmic economic activity. And so with the best of intentions, the Homeowners Loan Act began to secure these things. The consequence of this, and this is again the opening gambit of the shift uh, in that trap being set, is that it also broadened the pool of people that could still participate in the market, which meant that prices could still rise because there was a greater pool of buyers that could always meet whatever that new threshold was because they were not flush with cash, but they actually had the ability to still buy in. So people that would otherwise have been pushed to the sidelines by economic conditions suddenly said, I can still be in the game. And they could be in the game in a very modest way, having a 10-year or 15-year or 20-year mortgage. Now that seems really good, and Norm's a jerk for pointing out that maybe that wasn't a good idea, right? We want people to stay in their homes, we want this type of thing to happen. But the result of it is it began to shift the way in which housing was viewed, and as a result, began to introduce the idea that housing could be both shelter and investment. A fundamental shift that began to emerge, a massive change in the way that we began to view these things. And, and this became underscored at the end of World War II. This is a story that especially is fueled by the Americans, but like I said, we smuggled in a few American ideas into Canada as well. 
And around 1944, unlike in World War I, where military strategists and military leaders and local economists uh, didn't really know how things were going to turn out with the Kaiser, when it came to World War II, there was a perception that after D-Day and after its capacity to actually have broken the stranglehold in Europe, as well as advances that were being made in the Pacific theater, that it was just a matter of when before the war would cease. And in that context, one of uh, President um, Eisenhower's uh, chief economic lieutenants, I can't remember, his first name's Paul, his last name is, I can't remember, um, he said, were the war to end suddenly, there would be ushered in the greatest period of unemployment and industrial dislocation which any economy has ever faced. There was a recognition, all of our plants that have been turned uh, to the work of churning out munitions and churning out tanks and all that stuff. Our workforce that has been doubled in capacity by the introduction of far more women into our workforce. Uh, the capacity of all of these additional people who have gone off, fought for us, uh, been compensated by us, but now are going to return and are basically going to swamp our labor pool. We need to do something about this. We're going to have a capital problem and a labor problem. And when you have both of those, you get wars not long afterwards. Look at places like Syria, look at places like Sudan, look at uh, places like Somalia, so many other parts of the world where when there is a displacement of people's capacity to find work as well as have access to capital, war lingers. This is the story of, of World War I in so many ways as well, why it began uh, to give rise then to the seeds of World War II. But out of this, the realization was we have access to a tool that got us out of a Great Depression. And then access to that tool was the capacity to borrow against one's future earnings, so in the mortgage, as well as systems of developing on vacant land that would actually allow you to put a lot of people to work, working in areas where previously there had been no activity. So you move something from being a farm field to suddenly being a hustling, bustling construction site. And you make it super easy to do this. It was always going to be difficult to upgrade the, the Hudson's Bay Company right at the downtown, you know, key location. And you're having to like take a large granite building, you're having to adapt it. There's a lot of complexity to that. You would have one major contractor that could do the work. But then if you wanted to do the site right next door where RBC had its headquarters, it was totally different. That's this complex process of, of places thickening up, or even some of your suburbs, say in Shaughnessy, to, to take those homes and, and adapt them and turn them into uh, walk-up apartments or things like that. All of that was rather messy, and yet this offered the, pro uh, the potential or the promise of simply a plug-and-play style of development. How attractive that was. It was sort of like you previously had to chase bison, now you get to watch your rows, and you just got to water them at the right moment, and you make off like bandits. And so, as a result, here is all of a sudden this way to juice your economy. Keep people employed, put capital to work, and basically create the conditions for a new middle class, which is how it was defined across the United States. And we see in the exact same time uh, this pattern unfolding in North America. Oh, we've got, uh, let's make sure, on my slide. There we go. And so it was an exceptional growth machine. Critical to see how this was developing. Uh, this is when Langley begins to Blow, uh, blossom. This is when Maple Ridge becomes a place that people want to live. This is when so many of these communities, White Rock, all of a sudden begins to take on a, a new look uh, as people say, oh, we can make something happen over there. Um, and so uh, what does this look like in, for cities? Uh, if you have followed Strong Towns, maybe you've seen this, this diagram before. Uh, but this is an example of Fresno, but so many other places are like it. Uh, Vancouver is a little bit uh, prescribed or um, hemmed in by geography, but actually not that much. But in 1897, you see some development, a sort of a, a gradual outward expansion, but at the same time, the population of the place increasing as a greater density was enabled within the community. Uh, again, just a 20, uh, about what, 9, uh, 11, 13 years later, you see, you'll still see another modest sort of development. This is in the heart of the Great Depression, or sorry, uh, the run-up to the Great Depression. Even during the Great Depression, you're still seeing some added additional development on the outskirts of the city, but there's a thickening up, there's a maturing of the places within. By 1946, they've just finished fighting a war, and here you see some new neighborhoods being established, new opportunities being created on the outskirts of the city, but the vast majority of it, uh, the vast majority of that activity is still happening within the place. All of a sudden, you supercharge the process 
And you put people to work, you pour tons of money into the process, you create housing as a commodity and as an investment, and all of a sudden you begin to see this rapid outward expansion. Into the 80s, uh, this is when they're beginning to begin to run on fumes. Places are beginning to identify budgetary shortfalls. And so they're saying, we got to double down. We need to commit even for further. Let's build more neighborhoods and the, we'll keep uh, the debt at bay. We'll keep uh, the bad days away. And so by 2010, uh, you get into the situation, and, and here it's described a little bit differently. Uh, this is the city of Peterborough, Ontario, in case you wonder, hey, is it the same in Canada? Uh, you could see this, this, this capacity that we had, uh, and notice that, that sudden drop in population density uh, right here in the 1950s up to the 1970s. There was that com a, a, a city as a, a conflagration of people being together doing vitally important economic things, and then it becomes spread. Uh, it becomes far uh, more difficult. And as you see, this was uh, uh, the gray shows the amount of road per person. And so you have eight kilometers of, uh, pardon me, eight meters of road per person uh, back in the day, as even the population density continues to increase. That's a more efficient use of existing infrastructure. But when you all of a sudden get up into the 11s, the 12s, you have no increase. If you have no new density, that means you're still providing all of this capacity for people to live there, but you have a small, much smaller tax base to be able to cover uh, the needs that you've created. Uh, we talk about this, this is part of Strong Towns Canon, uh, that this also extends to infrastructure. So this is uh, Fayetteville, or, I mean uh, Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, back in 1949, small relatively small population of 33,000. By 2015, they increased by three and a half times. At the same time, the amount of feet of pipe per person, that is the amount of investment in the ground to enable this amount of people, 35,000 people to live there, was five feet of pipe per person. But by 2015, you've had a three and a half times increase in people, but a 10x increase, and then 21.4 times increase in terms of the fire hydrant coverage and capacity, but also everyday maintenance bills, everyday obligations that came out of this. And out of this, you get this condition where you have a modest increase in population, but a significant increase in the amount of uptake that you need to have. Uh, Kansas City, uh, the population increased by 1.8 times, but the feet of sewer pipe per person grew by 27 times. It looks a lot like a cancer, something that takes hold and metastasizes without creating the capacity to actually generate sufficient revenues uh, to make a return on this. Um, sewer system change over time in South Bend, Indiana. This is from our friends at Urban 3. Population increases by negative 22%, and yet the number of lift stations and miles of force main grow, grows dramatically. That is a far less efficient, effective land use pattern that simultaneously degrades the capacity of a city to provide for what it needs. And is it any wonder that South Bend struggles to keep up with its maintenance obligations? This is where the one of the mercies of being in a place where we have still managed to steward uh, to a fairly a certain extent uh, the, the systems that we have uh, means that we have high producing valuable places uh, in Vancouver proper. Uh, one of the things that props up Vancouver is its high rate of offices, although those are threatened right now by occupancy problems, but also industrial, all of those things. Uh, when I worked for Surrey Mayor Diane Watts, uh, we would always complain because it was, Vancouver had all the jobs, we had all the residences, and the residences, though we never saw population decline, the residences were required so much capacity to provide that level of service, the level of obligation that it was committing us to. And so they're trying to rectify this with employment strategies, with commercial, with office, all of the things that they're doing, uh, but they're way behind the eight ball and going to really struggle as they try to do this. Uh, one of the things uh, our friends at Urban 3 identified was uh, the way in which the urban development pattern in, uh, this is in Wellington, Florida, a very nice property on, on a, I think it's a sizable property, a $29.7 million for an area of, that had been developed as an urban neighborhood in their city. And yet, there were other buildings within the city and other developments that had occurred before the Second World War uh, that would, if they had built out it that way, generated $422 million, a massive increase in what was possible versus what actually occurred. 15 minutes or so? Five minutes. Five, all right. Um, I'm gonna go fast. I thought I had till quarter after. All right. Um, just to, again, reiterate this, and then we're gonna go into solutions or uh, things that we can do to touch on this. Um, this is in Chilliwack, BC. Uh, on the right is a small organic grocer. 
uh, valued at $1.9 million, but its actual per acre value is $17.3 million per acre. And the one on the left is the one uh, that is owned by the Loblaws Company, Superstore, and with prime access, all sorts of public investment only returns $3.43 million per acre. This means that, and I calculated the property tax, it, this little organic grocer pays 14 times as much on a per acre basis that the superstore does. And I'm like, is it any wonder that your rutabagas cost a little bit more because of the consequence that we lay, lay on our organic grocer and yet exempt our other properties from? And so one of the challenges that we have is that our neighborhoods are changing. Uh, will they become more exclusive and expensive or inclusive and diverse? Um, I'm gonna cut through this. Oh man. Oh, this one. I mean, here's the challenge that we also face in the midst of this housing trap. Uh, who benefits from high house prices? Our local governments do, provincial government with the land transfer tax, so many other things that they're basically able to count upon high values uh, for properties to continue to sort of underscore uh, the, the returns that they expect. Federal government, existing homeowners, bank and insurance companies, developers, uh, realtors, pension funds, and yet the challenge is the growing mass of people who are renters and the poor who are chronically afflicted by uh, the consequences that, we, consequences that we've created for ourselves. One of these is the absence of things that resemble starter homes, small, modest structures that were forbidden and banned in vast majorities of North America, uh, to the point where, as you can see in red, is, is the amount of money that you could spend uh, for a, a uh, percent of sales uh, is, oh yeah, a, a house that was less than $200,000. And you can see just its evaporation across North America and the consequence, I mean, here you know, uh, $200,000 doesn't even get you a, a utility shed, let alone anything that you can live in. Um, and so we say, like, we've veered off the path. We've, we've suddenly found ourselves adrift, and we've kept trying to hit the gas. We've kept trying to create the conditions that would just get us the logical outcome we wanted, which was great communities uh, for the people that can afford it. But we've lost our way, and we've run into the ditch. Um, we need to lower the bar of entry. Uh, I always love this. Even in our region, where it seems like there's so much uh, that's simply built up and we can't touch it anymore, there's actually so many available places that with proper permitting changes and regulation changes, we would allow, notice the amount of increase of potential housing units in these places. And Vancouver's led the way in terms of laneway houses, but man, oh man, is there more to do on this front. Uh, we need starter homes uh, and, and starter commercial businesses to be the path that we create for people. Um, uh, we need non-market housing, uh, as always. Many participants in the housing market. Uh, we need to remove barriers. <laughs> I'm running through this way too fast. So uh, we got to get rid of mandatory parking minimums. Uh, we need to remove mandatory minimum lot sizes, uh, building codes that are forbidding cheaper and better ways of designing buildings. So major change around single stair buildings or single point access buildings uh, is really good. Uh, right to your MLAs con uh, confirm this approach. Uh, design requirements that do the same. Uh, there's so much there, uh, the uncertainty and the delay in the development approval process. Um, again, allow the next increment by right. This is where I just want to highlight the value of the provincial actions that have taken place, not as a political statement, just as a policy question as to whether or not this should be done. Uh, legalizing the next increment by right. Um, we need to, you know, rem all of these things, I'm just going to blitz right through uh, and just confirm for you, like, the traditional development pattern offers us a path to freedom from the housing trap that we're in. If we persist in this, uh, we will find ourselves uh, able to then begin to turn the tide. I would say the suburban experiment has an 80 year head start on you and me. And so we need to spot ourselves at least 40 years before we start to get really discouraged. The trouble is, I'm gonna be quite broke for the next 40 years until we finally begin to resolve many of these things. It will be a constant struggle. And yet the truth is like, we can begin to see these changes occur. We've seen examples in New Zealand, we've seen examples in California, we've seen examples in Washington. We are actually becoming looked at as an example of other uh, jurisdictions to model. For the first time we had a federal housing, uh, or a federal election where housing was on the ballot and people determined that they were all, in three major parties include, and the bloc, were actually in favor of expanding housing supply. There's so many challenges as to how we get there, uh, but I'm confident that we can. So thank you for taking time out tonight, tonight uh, to be part of this. Let's continue the conversation. I believe we're going for beers or something else afterwards uh, at a conveniently located establishment. And 
you've got my, uh, my emails, Norm at Strong Towns, if you want to reach out. Uh, but yeah, as Chuck would say, and I'll, I'll say too, I'll keep doing what you can to build a strong town. Thank you.